and a warm welcome. You're joining us here at Hyde Park on Other Therana 24. Tonight we're talking about uh, the contribution of a female workforce to an economy. How women entrepreneurship can support Sri Lanka's economic revival. What opportunities Sri Lankan corporates and the society has provided for women's engagement to contribute at large to Sri Lanka's economic revival. I've invited to our studios an all-female um, panel here. Let me start with Dr. Sulochana Segera, uh, founder chairperson of Women in Management. A very warm welcome. Good to have you back. Thank you for having us. Um, we also have with us here Sarah Twig, Program Manager for Women in Work of the International Finance Corporation. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks, it's a pleasure to be here. We also have with us Kasturi Chellaraja, the first female CEO of a conglomerate in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my pleasure, Indumavi. Um, yes, it's, it's nice to have. I, I, some of you have been here, but uh, it's also your first time here at Hyde Park, uh, Sarah. But I'd like to start off with you, um, Dr. Solochana Sigera. Um, we're talking about women, um, whether in work, whether um, at employment or entrepreneurship. Um, as we talk about the contribution of women, here you are uh, contributing through an effort to empower women. This is your 13th time um, that you're going forward with the awards recognizing women champions in society as well as male champions were supporting uh, the contribution of women and also you're bringing together from 18 countries um, a, a global forum why a global forum at this point to Sri Lanka so the same question was asked by someone a few weeks ago mm -hmm. Uh, the question was whether Sri Lanka is ready to have a glo global forum. Oh. So if we wait for everything to be right, I don't think Sri Lanka will be ever ready. So when we had it, uh, first time when we had it a global forum, it was UAE. And where actually 23 countries attended. So in my mind, I was thinking, why not Sri Lanka? Why can't I bring these people to Sri Lanka? Because now many of us has to understand with the uh, COVID and everything, we are connected to the global. And Sri Lankan women, um, I think we are ready to go to global, but there are less opportunities. So why not, I, I took that risk of bringing it to Sri Lanka. And if you ask me whether I regret it, no, I don't regret it, but uh, whether Sri Lanka is ready or not, I can't say, but I think this is the right time to bring in a global forum to Sri Lanka, where, because Sri Lanka has been a very resilient country. And that's mainly because of us women. Mm -hmm. Women has played a major role on the resilience. But we have not been highlighted, our resilience as women. So that's why we thought the recovery of the, actually the top, the theme goes as take, uh, getting women to come onto the recovery of Sri Lankan mm -hmm. economy. So get, telling the world our own stories and connecting the opportunities for Sri Lankan women to think beyond that island mindset and tell them there's a huge opportunity. That was the reason for me to bring a global event to Sri Lanka. How many are you hosting? So uh, 18 countries. Mm -hmm. So actually uh, the awards has 20 award winners who are representing those countries and 30 from Sri Lanka. And we have speakers also for mainly uh, 35 speakers representing other countries. Others are Sri Lanka. So 65 speakers on all two and a half days. I think that's one of the major events we are doing in Sri Lanka. And it will be a huge uh, impact to Sri Lanka if we take it positively. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think uh, IFC has done a lot of studies and research on uh, the kind of um, environment Sri Lanka, the, the conducive, whether it's conducive or not, uh, for female engagement in workplace, uh, leadership, and also entrepreneurship. Um, we know that some 25% are engaged in SMEs. And that's very low compared to uh, how we see other countries that have seen women and female uh, contribution to whether it's entrepreneurship, businesses, or in leadership, leadership positions to propel economic growth. So what challenges do you think, Sarah, mm -hmm. uh, Sri Lanka needs to work on now to improve those numbers? Yeah, so I mean, as the, one of the, as the largest development institution focused on the private sector, Gender is a really core part of what IFC does globally. Mm -hmm. So this is not something we're just doing in Sri Lanka. This is something that we do everywhere. 
Uh, in Sri Lanka, we're really lucky to have had the partnership of the Government of Australia for the last six years under the Women in Work program, where we have been working across the private sector. We've been working with large businesses to tackle challenges around getting more women formally employed, getting more women into leadership roles in corporates. We've also been working with the financial sector on what the financial sector can be doing to be better serving women customers, whether they're individual women or, or women business owners. Um, and also working with, with larger businesses on how they can support women who might be in their supply chain, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think what we see is that some of the challenges that women face, wherever they are in the economy, are the same. So we know that things like uneven household responsibilities, and in particular, the um, responsibilities associated with care, so childcare and elder care, are some of the fundamental challenges that women face when it comes to being able to participate fully, whether it's as a business owner, whether it's as an employee, or whether it's as a business leader. Um, we also know that you know, social norms around the types of roles that women should be doing or shouldn't be doing, the roles that men should be playing at work or at home, those are also really fundamental in terms of driving women into certain types of jobs, uh, you know, the types of industries that women might work in. So we've also been working with a lot of companies to put in place supports that actually enable women to work in you know, really male dominated areas. Um, so looking at things like the ports and whether women can be actively um, engaged as, as operators of large cranes, looking at automo automobile industry, women as engineers. And we're really seeing that there is this momentum for change among the whole business community because I think businesses recognise that in order to succeed and in order to access the best talent, they need to be supportive of women and they need to be providing the environments that enable women to not only join their workplace, but to stay and to stay through those, those personal transitions like getting married, like having children. Uh, but we are seeing a really strong commitment from companies to be doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to turn to um, Kasturi, Kasturi Chelaraja, whose name is synonymous with um, well, empowered women, women who contribute to the Sri Lankan economy. But uh, I'd like to ask you, the, the, the kind of uh, corporate setup in Sri Lanka, do you think that now nurtures women to go into leadership positions? Do we do enough to allow that? I know, I know corporates have to, at the same time, um, uh, face other challenges posed by economic circumstances right now, but that, that's an entirely different conversation. But, but the setup, you've, you've come to a leadership position. Um, but when I read the numbers here, it says only 37% uh, in Sri Lanka by uh, 2022 have uh, contributed to uh, leadership positions. And of that also, the female employment numbers are very low. So coming from that stat, I think it's 37% of women are active actively participating in economic activity, I mean, they're participating in work. I think out of that will be entrepreneurs might be 25%. Taking from Sarah's point, look, we have to solve certain problems. It's about equity, right? Um, women have the problem of care, whether it's child care or elderly care. Women have to take the adjustment or be account, they take the ownership of adjusting to social norms. You're not talking about men adjusting anywhere, right? So in these two problems, and that's a, that, those two problems are corporate can't crack. But we can accept that these are things we need to address and support women to, to make sure that they can, they can take care um, as well as be mindful of the social press pressures or home pressures they have in types of roles they take and how do they succeed. Today's context at a corporate, uh, leadership is less than 10%, it's a single digit, right? Uh, we have to crack the problem of 37% to single digit, it's the transition moments. How do you support them? But more importantly, how do you get more women in and allow them to succeed? Purely, it's an economic requirement because the best talent, if they are out of the workforce, forget the country, or the, country the companies won't survive. If we are to come out of this, Today we are operating in um, global pressures. We operate in local high inflationary pressures, high tax regimes, and we have to compete now with global companies. You need the best talent, and it so happens, minimum 50% of the best talent is women. If that's not represented, there's something, we are not going to be able to compete. 
So the corporates have to take a step back and say, what do we need to allow women to succeed? That's one part of it. Of course, succeed means helping them to understand mm -hmm. themselves as leaders, giving, supporting them in transitioning into roles. Um, very importantly, helping them to accept their own skills or strengths and owning it and being a female leader and empowering them to own it. The other side of it is culturally and, and obviously the rest of the bosses or the boards are male dominant and the leadership is majority men. You have to actually sensitize them to understand diversity comes with you being open to listening to viewpoints which are not going to be your viewpoint. And it's coming from a person who doesn't look like you, who doesn't talk like you, and from, from where they come, feminine, it's a feminine person, but a female in a feminine role, but might sound a bit more assertive and, and in their viewpoint may be aggressive, the choices of words they use, and I've, I've been told that about myself. But I don't take offenses because that's how they see a woman at home. So it's both sides have to adjust. Corporates, I must say, the larger corporates are doing a lot. That's the reason you, you find young, empowered women leaders who are really flourishing, right, in very unconventional roles. Um, SMEs have to start opening out. Remember, SMEs come from family. Most of them are, might be family-owned companies who have evolved. I think that they come from a place of protection. Uh, women shouldn't be sent out at, in the evening. They shouldn't be doing this. That's true, maybe in this environment, but how do you also empower them to succeed and give them roles? There is improvement, there is also decrease as well. I think the 37% of women in active labor force has come down to about 35%. 35 percent. So overall yes. context has come down. Mm -hmm. Within that, I think the leadership part is improving because purely because there are some big corporates who are really actively pushing this agenda. But when we challenge these social norms, it's open to, um, the, this question is open to all of you. Um, how, how do you think we overcome these challenges? SM is also bringing them uh, to involve more women and for women to engage in more uh, leadership positions as well. How do you think we could create collectively uh, that environment for women to engage, especially when we have challenges um, in a setup as ours? Maybe I'll, I'll reflect on some work we've just done with mm -hmm. uh, over 40 companies. And this was companies ranging from some larger multinationals through to smaller, medium-sized businesses across a range of sectors across the country. We worked with these companies to really try and address some of these underlying challenges, um, as Kasturi was saying. And so things like, what can they do to be more flexible? How can they enable their workforce, both women and men, to have more flexibility in when and where they work? Looking at things like making sure there's a respectful workplace, so there's no harassment, there's no bullying, that when people turn up to work, they feel comfortable. Also looking at what they can do in terms of building that pipeline of talent. So if they've got, you know, let's say they maybe only have 10% women in leadership, what do they need to do to get those 30, 40% of women at their junior levels ready so they can take on those leadership roles? And we saw across these companies a phenomenal set of results over just two years. So a 55% increase in the share of women in management roles, mm -hmm. a 17% increase in the share of women on boards. We saw um, half of the companies said they experienced improved productivity, uh, and over two thirds said that, they had, uh, that their employees were more satisfied with their jobs. So really meaningful progress in a relatively short space of time. And I think what we learned was companies have the appetite. They just don't necessarily know what to do or how to do it. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we've been focused on in the Women in Work program is actually giving companies the tools and resources they need to be able to do that. And we've had some fantastic examples. I mean, one medium-sized company in the automotive, automotive industry. When we started the work, it was a sole proprietorship, just um, the, the father of the family was the only, board of, uh, the only director. Through the course of the, of the program, the, the two daughters and the wife also became appointed as directors because they already had this active role in the business and now they have this formal role in actually decision making about the business. And we saw those kind of changes time and time again um, and heard from these companies about the material way that it's actually positively impacting their ability to recruit better staff, to retain the staff they have, and to get those women moving through the business so that they have opportunities to grow and to stay. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you had something to add also to add to it how do we really work on addressing those challenges preventing uh, women um, engaging in the workforce or starting their own business two problems um, engaging in the workforce I think um, the aspiration whether they want to I think there's one part of it you find the next gen wanting to do things on their own corporates are no longer um, uh, the preferred employment mm. um, and it may be because we are not really agile or having this matrix ways of working we are very hierarchical and that doesn't work with that gen um, what Sarah says has actually helped organization to handle and allow women to act, do their job more freely and feel that uh, they don't have to apologize for having to care for your kid or your parent or go early. Um, the second phase I think we need to challenge uh, to crack and that may be by storytelling or examples would be the biases which you live with day in and day out. Um, for example, I was offering a move for a, one of the smart leaders because it was st smart talent has to go through the pipeline and can be a potential leader of the group mm -hmm. and, um, and the person's first question was um, okay this role would mean I need to meet people and does it mean that do I have to do entertain people in the nights and I so I looked I took a deep breath because it's very sensitive and I had to only explain it the way I knew how to explain. I said, when I took logistics or maritime, one big thing about me, they all said is, look, you need to learn to play golf and drink with the guys. And I chose not to do both. Mm. But I still grew the business. So I said, look, you have to own it and make it your own, but make sure people see value in what you bring. Right? And she was comfortable. And the next question I couldn't answer was the, whether our men are ready to have a strong, powerful wife who is out there working and she said you know I can't do this too late is because uh, I'll have problems at home so where I'm coming from is those are biases we have to break over time one is by storytelling and explaining them that these things can be done be done an alternate way which is unique to you and you should own it second thing is parenting and schools and and that will it'll take a generation or more to even change because your view gets embodied and how a kid sees the mother at home and how she, the ecosystem between two parents will get translated in how he or she would behave mm. when they become adults and where they perceive their role is. So if we want to change that, we have to change it at parenting and school and the social and society at large. And it's not Sri Lankan problem at all. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a universal problem. I've been... Um, speaking at some regional and global events and I realize it's a universal thing and sometimes I tell my examples and they go wow we face the same thing and I think it's it's beyond borders it's just a, how families societies ecosystems operate so those biases also have to be moved out uh, to enable women to succeed as leaders as well uh, when we talk about the, the, the question that you said you stumbled upon and then um, uh, addressing the questions and uncertainties of how men will react to uh, strong, powerful leaders in leadership positions. I think you, Solochana, have been um, also recognizing male champions through your awards for these last 13 years. And this time around, I saw a few uh, interesting topics uh, that you brought uh, to discuss tourism altogether. How do we make it a safe place for women? Um, it's quite interesting. I don't think we as the media too have really looked at these questions. Uh, so tell us what, what the angle here is. Yeah, before that I'll just say this, spoke about the private yes, sector. Yes, yes. Because the state sector is working on it because yes, uh, I think they had a labor department is doing the labor laws in Sri Lanka. So I was asked to come and present from the women aspects. So one of the key issues they had is allowing women to work on night shift. Sri Lanka doesn't allow. So the male comment was uh, night uh, women should is not safe. They didn't understand that they are not going to work for 24 hours. It's a shift basis so that the parent, at least the women can choose whether night shift or the day shift while the children will have a father or mother one at a time. Mm. So the, but 
lot of men actually oppose. And also getting female into promoting, they are trying to give some incentives or marking schemes for organization, which is a good uh, way of moving forward. So I presented all this while we private sector do something, the state sector also has to come and also I think the education system also doing a different aspect. So if both can come together, Sri Lanka will have at least 1% uh, success on something about diversity. Coming to your question, yes, this is something I really wanted to look at because we, Sri Lanka is a country for tourism was bra got branded without gain, getting branded. No one actually promotes Sri Lanka. It's the people who experience Sri Lanka who promoted. I always feel that Sri Lanka never promoted us, the Sri Lanka. It's the people who visited. And the world is now talking about women tourism and solar tourism. Where we country getting a lot of people to promote Sri Lanka, we can actually speak about our own women and also the tourism for women to be safe. Every country has their own stories, but we have a history of women in tourism. And but for some reason, we don't speak about it. So that's why uh, there's a panel discussion where we speak about women in tourism, because that's the segment Sri Lanka should be looking into. And that's a segment in uh, future years that whole world is looking at. And also not just tourism, we have included the women in sports. I remember Sara was asking me, why you have put sports in the panel? <laughs> I said, in Sri Lanka, sports is not a career in Sri Lanka, unless you are in the male cricket board, all male cricketer. They get jobs, they get advertisements, they get, but all, all other track, uh, most of the, actually the track runners and players, they have to find their sponsors and get it done. So this is something I want to look, put it in and tell that sports can be a career where women also can be a brand ambassador, not just to, to the sports, but to the country and private sector. Interesting. Uh, uh, you spoke about the state sector. Um, Kasturi is on a board, uh, uh, is a member of a unit um, trying to look at mechanisms to restructure state-owned enterprises. I want to know whether the question of women leadership and how they can contribute to solving most of our um, uh, redundant state-owned enterprise uh, issue uh, could be addressed. Whether that has been looked at. Um, I think what. That committee is a sensitive question. I, I'll, I'll try to answer what I can. Mm -hmm. The um, what you're in task with is to make um, state sector more productive or reform it so that it's productive. Second aspect is um, which is universal. Government should be shouldn't be in business. So anything for profit, if some private sector can take it over and run, make sure you. You design the process where somebody else can come and independently without influence do the right thing. If I talked about the first thing, I mean, leaving the, my role there as a citizen, I'm, I'm going to talk as a citizen here, is the reason I, I people asked why did, would, did I agree to do it is, look, we all can be armchair critics about everybody, but if the country is to come out of this, we have two problems to crack. We had one to get in our revenues in terms of dollars and earnings, which so low will, hmm. I, I hope our entrepreneurs can do it. Second is top, all our earnings, which has, we pay taxes, we all pay, down we have all paid increased taxes, taxes. But where is it being used? We should be, be able to say, look, I'm getting this benefit by contributing so much by tax. At the moment, it's going into, 80% of it goes into running the public sector, which if you look at any metric of productivity and efficiency is not, is not efficient. Um, the power minister has uh, very credibly brought out metrics to show how, how they're going to go, go about it, and that's the way every ministry should look at it. So I don't think at this point, whether it's male or women is being addressed, at this point it's bare efficiency. What are the outcomes? What should be, what should government focus on and what shouldn't government focus on? Mm -hmm. And how can we get our economy more efficient? Because we have to spend less, earn more, and create reserves. Simple math, I mean, it's like a home or a company. 
Uh, you're very positive about the, uh, the crisis, uh, overcoming uh, the path to uh, overcoming the crisis. Uh, about dollar reserves to how we are looking at it. And, and so you keep bringing in, um, the, uh, along with the awards, you're bringing in a global forum as well. But together, uh, how do you think some of these participants here, we can have an opportunity in Sri Lanka to engage with them to see how partnerships could be struck uh, in order to um, make arrangements where uh, there's a win-win and Sri Lanka is also able to uh, win in a way to overcome um, the challenges we face today? So we uh, hardly, Sri Lankans get to go for international forum outside because it's expensive with the dollar rate to buy a ticket at a conference. So that was the main thing. So actually, uh, normally conferences happen till 6 p.m. But we are finishing by 3.30 and opening it for participants to speak to these uh, people who has come from. And also, we are not just talking about gender. This is nothing about just gender and diversity. We are talking about economics, funding, entrepreneurship, everything. So whoever is interested, they can go and speak to these people. They are here for three days. So and we have said, uh, even corporates, we personally write and say, send your middle management also, because they are the going to be a leader. If we, we have an issue that we don't actually give opportunities for the middle management, and middle management also waits till the corporate sponsor them. So that attitude stop both the organization and the employee. And this opportunity that whether you are being sponsored or not, invest in our money and come and meet these people. It can be an entrepreneur who are looking for an who are looking for a partner or a customer. It can be someone who's looking to be uh, recruited. These are the opportunities. And I think that's how we have said, and the website is there. They can just looking and online, they can register it. All payments or anything they can, they can, the, what we have given is they can upload their profile onto that. So anyone can read their profile. Mm -hmm. So there, the opportunity is being open. It's us so to is take this it. open, um, it's not just for corporate uh, CEOs and that level, but it's also no, for middle managers. it's for everyone managers. and it's not for women uh, only. Right. It's for men, women, everyone. Uh -huh. So I think I wouldn't look at it as a conference. I would look at it as a market access trade show. Mm -hmm. One commonality is you have women champions around from 18 countries who are there. The challenges everybody, I mean particularly Sri Lankan entrepreneurs would have is how do you get your product or service out there? Mm -hmm. Which country do I go to? How do I understand that consumer? In a, even if I have a right to play in that country, how do I get market access? If you can solve one or two of those by meeting these people there, and one commonality is, is that women, the women who are coming there, they have achieved great things within their own industry and country. They come with the passion of giving back. And that's where we, I see that it can happen as a global thing or a network uh, solo creates because I, I've seen women in Sri Lanka for the last 13 years. I was a recipient, I think, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, 11 years. And the ecosystem is we give back because we are exposed to the different stories and mm -hmm. we want others to succeed. You create the same ecosystem out here. And I'm sure you can start small. This might be the first year. But if we can create this whole network of the next big brand of helping market access. Next question is, how do I understand the consumer out there? And one of the things that, that you know, we've been trying to do at the, the forum as well is to bring other players who can help with that market access. So for example, one of the commercial banks that IFC has been working with has launched an online marketplace for mm -hmm. small businesses. This is a marketplace that they can get access to financing, they can engage with other businesses, they can look for export opportunities. And so by coming to the forum also, businesses can start to understand what kind of opportunities exist like that, online opportunities where they can actually grow their market, they can meet new partners. Mm -hmm. um, so the forum, as I think, as they've both rightly said, brings together so many different pieces of the puzzle um, and the more diverse the audience as well, the more useful it's going to be for everyone who's there. Right, I think uh, we have uh, much to discuss, but we'll come back after this short break here at Hyde Park on Other Therana 24 to talk about women in management, leadership positions and entrepreneurship and the contribution impact on the Sri Lankan economy and the region after this short break to stay with us.
Welcome back. You're joining us back at Hyde Park on Adha Dharana 24. Um, according to IFC's findings, um, I think I, I have a 2021 report, but it says some 29% of GDP of Sri Lanka is contributed directly by women. Um, and as as we move into a as we moved into a crisis after that period and now what are your latest findings and the kind of impact um, that that women make on the economy and at the same time has your country specific agenda changed to match the current uh, challenges emanating as a result of the crisis and the requirements here yeah i mean ifc has always been focused on tackling the, you know, the most pressing challenges in a market. Now, in Sri Lanka, of course, some of those are, are macroeconomic, which um, IFC works with, with the private sector. Um, but when we think about the impact of women on the economy, and particularly in, in the process of, um, you know, economic recovery, mm -hmm. we know, for example, that when you have more women in senior leadership and on boards, there is a material business return to that. Now, that, of course, has a positive impact on the economy. We did a study last year with the top, looking at the top, 30 listed companies on the Colombo Stock Exchange. We found that those companies that had a higher proportion of women on their boards also saw higher returns on equity. So a very clear link between the, the role that women play in managing and in leading businesses and the types of uh, returns that you're seeing. Now, of course, in terms of economic recovery, the more resilient that our large private sector businesses are, the faster that recovery will come. So I think that's a very central part of the, the process. The other piece, of course, which IFC is, is heavily involved in is the financial sector. And that's going to be a really core part of, of the economic recovery. We see that there's a real opportunity when, we think, when we're looking at the gender aspect for women to be more actively uh, involved in, in accessing financing, in accessing um, other types of, of financial assets. One of the areas we've been looking at, for example, is insurance. We've been working with an insurance company to actually understand what is it that women need from their insurance, which is, of course, particularly critical during COVID and now during a crisis. That insurer has designed a specific suite of products that respond to the needs of women and their families. Um, and by doing so, also helping to ensure the financial protection of ordinary Sri Lankans, not just at the, at the economic or the, you know, the private sector level. So we're really looking to what are those levers in different parts of the economy that can help provide the stability that the country needs to, to move forward and also providing those new opportunities. So looking at you know, new areas of financing, um, mm -hmm. particularly looking at things like the climate. What are the opportunities um, for for Sri Lanka to be really pushing the agenda on climate. Of course, it's a very climate vulnerable country. Um, and so working with the financial sector on different types of financing um, and how that can, can benefit uh, you know, gr new green industries, for example. Um, so I think we're taking a very, um, a very wide lens view on the different parts of the economy that can be supported to really support that, that recovery. And women are central in all of those different elements. Right. Um, I'd like to go back to the question uh, on tourism. I like that um, that that you've carefully uh, selected the kind of areas that we should address, even through conversation, to spur that kind of uh, dialogue on what uh, challenges we have and how Sri Lankan private sector or um, uh, international non-governmental agencies' contribution can uh, help Sri Lanka address these. But when you come to tourism, we're expecting a boom here in Sri Lanka um, as, as we try to recover from this crisis. Uh, but why really do you think we fail to create that secure, um, that, that environment uh, so that women who visit Sri Lanka, of course, um, the Sri Lanka is a beautiful country and we have a, a, a stronger system here to support women, children who travel here. But the question of how is um, how how do we create a safer place for uh, tourism, women travelling to Sri Lanka? I'd like to know um, how how that came about. I think it has to start from the we are still trying to promote tourism, having old laws, and not understanding the global market. We don't have to look far. If you look Maldives, what they promote their beaches, but how they promote it, anyone can access. The system itself allowed them while protecting their citizens. I think Sri Lanka, what I really felt was we are promoting Sri Lanka while holding all the unwanted laws and systems without uh, really putting it out. For example, we say anyone can come and we visit Sri Lanka. 
But the visa process, because I'm telling it very openly, I went through a lot of to get these women. I didn't know there was an uh, issue in Sri Lanka on visas. But then when I re inquired, it's a long time being there, but it has not been addressed. So why are we going to talk about tourism while having the old laws in Sri Lanka? And also Sri Lanka should understand while we actually protect our culture and everything, we should move forward. How Malaysia is doing it, how Indonesia now actually if you look at, we go for all tourism exhibitions, but we never speak about how safe it is for women to travel. We do not talk about how venues can be given for global conferences, how they can have an event in an island. We never speak about, we just say we are a good country for tourism. Are we really highlighting what the tourism is? I have not seen that. So actually with the forum, we are first time having a symposium uh, with the Colombo University uh, Tourism Economics. Mm -hmm. They are doing a Women in Tourism, Women in Economics research paper. And eight countries has put their findings. So that we want to bring it to the tourism uh, private sector and say look at it positively. Otherwise, Sri Lanka will always talk about tourism, but we do not go beyond the tourism actually we are looking in. Uh, that's why I said a country which was promoted or branded not by Sri Lankans, but people who visited Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. um, as a private sector leader, a corporate leader who's, uh, who's contributing to the Sri Lankan economy, um, I'd like to know why now should we really uh, remain resilient as as it has been, uh, there have been discouraging times for us here in Sri Lanka. It has been tough. Last year, a crisis queues for fuel, necessities, and uh, we're slowly recovering. But at the same time, why we need to look at doing this right. Um, uh, Surajana just spoke, spoke about archaic laws in Sri Lanka. Why we should together address these laws now and not, ex not, not be discouraged that uh, this is never going to happen? There are a couple of reasons. One is, if we don't get it right, I don't know what's going to happen to us in five years from now. We, we don't have a second chance. Um, that's how deep the crisis is. You do see um, some form of normalcy. And I give credit to all parties, from, from the, the leader to the corporate sector to the people, right? Previously, to do, would you have had um, price increases, done without a strike or would you have uh, people saying it's okay to double your tax people are doing their part by supporting the tough calls the government has to take uh, corporates have absorbed the tough call of a trying to be in business b keeping people in employment and then paying increased taxes all because we know that this is needed from a government so far, we see that there seems to be, while there's tension for tough calls, but they seem to be more or less supporting. And that's where it lies. So the, the need is there. The will from the private sector and uh, the public citizens at large majority is aligned. Um, and the big question which has, which has brought the country successively take is politics, right? We've taken policies um, which are politically right and which is uh, which is which gives them a license to be elected. I think that is a responsible for a, to, it's a responsibility of every politician, every leader. They have to leave politics aside. And and what I tell all the time, can we put country in the center, right? And that's what's needed. Um, I guess why from the private sector we need to do these changes. A, like I said, we need to be more efficient. B, we need to attract dollars in and, and, and have access to markets, which means you need FDI, which, needs you need, which means that you need to be attracting investments from people around who could want to play in this region. Look at Vietnam. Don't go too hard, far. Look at Vietnam. Look at Korea. Mm -hmm. What did they do? They wooed investors and brought it. They changed laws to allow, it, allow the investors to succeed there. Today we are in a position, there is a China plus one. Why can't we play in the plus one? Or you align with India and try and get investment here. But they need to take some calls and choices. In, the, in ending, they, they can't be going out um, 
doing research and analyzing for years because this moment and this opportunity will pass if we don't do something about it. So the laws which are archaic is very relevant. It's not, not only tourism, from labor laws to um, in the way, manner in which we import and export, all that has to be re-looked at. Uh, in the, with the view of how can we accelerate and become an attractive destination for investment and market access for the region. Mm -hmm. So as Sri Lankan companies, we should be open for others to come in and invest here and, and be part of it. That's needed. So uh, amid, amid these, um, amid these tax uh, increases in taxes to uh, the other, other um, the pressures put on the society people, uh, there is one school of thought that yes, taxes should uh, increase. There's the other saying, no, corporates should pay more taxes. There are uh, the others who say, no, the, the most vulnerable should be avoided. They should be given more breathing space. But with all this, I'd like, uh, we don't have much time uh, on the program, but um, uh, Sarah, you too, you've been in the private sector. How, how do you think we can bring the private sector together to take a leading role, a lead role here in addressing these questions and push governments also um, to, to make the right choices. Uh, it's open to all three of you. So I'll, um, yes, you, what you say is right. So the first thing, taxes increased are the same taxpayers. So mm -hmm. it's deep within the same few, few 200,000 taxpayers. Make it wider. Corporates are being taxed at a maximum. So we are, we are attracting taxes which a developed country would pay, whereas a developing country would not be having that taxes, but they're sucking it up. But remember, there's a tipping point, right? Mm -hmm. The more, when the company cannot reinvest and grow, they will be looking at downsizing. So there is go going to be, if you don't keep it at a healthy ba balance, there's going to be unemployment. <coughs> I'm all for the vulnerable communities being supported with a, with a social security net. But it has to go to the right person without any leakage. We've been having, there's leakages. So they need to, so if we as citizens, the government, private sector, all think this country is ours, it's nobody else's. Everybody has made money some form or shape. Let's make sure that we do it right. We can take a deep breath and say we suck it up for another three years, but everyone has to take responsibility in um, doing their part. It can't be I'm going to make this, this whole culture of I'm going to get a deal out of this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make quick money out of this. And I'll be very open. That's the way access to power, you can do business. It should stop. If you want Sri Lanka to come out of this, that should stop. I think she said, oh, <laughs> as she said power and business is too yes. different. It's the opportunity was what you bring, not the power. I think people who are really talented, who has opportunities, has less opportunities in Sri Lanka. Don't look for why women who are not succeeded here when they go abroad, why they actually we don't have more women in politics, but many countries have Sri Lankan women in politics. Mm. That's example about the Sri Lanka. So why we are not seeing that? I think Sri Lanka is not uh, lack of education or anything. We are lack of common sense and values. I think Sarah, you'll have something to add too. Well, I think the only piece I would add is that you know when you when you talk about the vulnerable, for example, or, or, or you know or the poorest, is a lot of that is also about having access to good jobs. And so the private sector is a key way that, that the country can, can actually enable those people to earn their own living. Um, and so I think there's a, real, uh, a really meaningful role to play in, in facilitating the private sector to be able to cre create more of those jobs. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think uh, with, with high literacy rates among women here in Sri Lanka, maybe leaders should take um, the time to think about how we create um, opportunities and also bring women in the workforce and also create a more conducive social environment. Thank you very much uh, to the all-female panel, as I uh, mentioned before. It's amazing that, um, that we have 
women who make such an amazing, uh, impactful contribution to the Sri Lankan economy, to the people and uh, support us here in Sri Lanka th uh, through our INGOs as well. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sulochana Segera, founder chairperson of Women in Management, um, one of Sri Lanka's top social entrepreneurs, trainers, and also motivational speakers for over uh, two, three decades now. Thank you for your participation. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank Ms. Sarah Twig, Program Manager for Women in Work in Sri Lanka of the International Finance Corporation. You have uh, extensive um, expertise and experience in the private sector and um, gender specific work. So thank you very much for your contribution here tonight. And as I mentioned, we uh, had with us the first female CEO of a uh, uh, Sri Lankan a conglomerate in Sri Lanka, uh, Ms. Kasturi Chellaraja, who is also uh, the first female president of the Sri Lanka Chamber of Pharmaceutical Industry and uh, the managing director of Hemas Pharmaceuticals, joining us here tonight. Thank you for your contribution to the panel. Um, we were talking about the contribution of women, impact uh, on the economy and leadership uh, challenges at Hyde Park here on Other Than a 24. We'll see you again next week with yet another discussion. Until then, take care and enjoy the rest of our program live now. Good night. <laughs>